Hey guys and welcome back to, on our channel on this second video. In this second video we're going to be covering the drugs acting on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, first of all, let's just refresh some information that you already know. Uh, well, uh, if you can imagine that this is the structure of the nephron in our kidneys and uh, this would be the afferent arterial and this is the efferent arterial which is the exit, right? So um, I've written here an E just to uh, just so you don't get uh, confused. Now, basically, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is uh, the security system of the kidney. Now, what do I mean in that? It is basically the process by which the kidney is going to survive any stressful situation that happens to it. Now, what a stressful situation can happen to the kidney is basically decrease in the perfusion of the kidney. So basically decrease in the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, right? Now, because the kidney has a lot of active processes in its nephrons, it basically continuously needs a lot of oxygen and the nutrition so it can keep up with all of this active transport, right? So in order to do so, we need a proper perfusion of the kidney. And whenever it is decreased, the kidney gets alert and it basically activates the security system which is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, let's see what, we, what can get this activated. So basically, before getting into that, we have the so-called the juxtaglomerular cells, the JG cells, that are present in the afferent arterial in each nephron. Now, what is the function of these guys is basically to sense how much pressure is inside this afferent arterial. And whenever there is a decrease in this pressure, what is going to happen is that these cells are going to get activated. And when they are activated, they are going to release the pro-renin, which is going to be later be converted to the renin. Now, so let's see what can get these juxtaglomerular cells activated. First, let me actually cover the renal artery hypotension. Now, the renal artery hypotension is basically decreasing the blood pressure of the renal artery. Now, what, why can this happen? Why would this happen, right? We have two causes that it can be a systemic hypertension. So it is basically the whole blood pressure in everywhere in the body is actually decreased, including the renal artery. So these guys are gonna say, okay, so we have a hypertension in the renal artery, let's, uh, let's release uh, renin. Now, but it can also be a separated, isolated renal, renal artery hypertension. Uh, how can that happen is basically when there is a renal artery stenosis. So renal artery stenosis actually is a renal hypotension, but a systemic, maybe normal tension. It is like a normal uh, blood pressure, right? So this is the first thing that is going to get these guys activated, the juxtaglomerular cells. Now the second thing is basically the sympathetic nervous system. Whenever there is an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, this means that there is a release of the noradrenaline. And these juxtaglomerular cells, they have a beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which means that the released noradrenaline, due to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, is going to act on the beta-1 that is present in the juxtaglomerular cells, and it is going to lead to the release of the prorenin that is going to be converted later to the renin. This is the second cause. Now, the third cause is the decrease in the sodium chloride at the macula densa. So as you know, they're basically in the nephron, we've got here the proximal convoluted tubule and then the descending Henle and then we have the ascending Henle and then the distal tubule is going to loop around and it is going to form the macula densa right next to the Bowman's capsule, right? Now, the macula densa, these are basically special cells that are able to sense the concentration of the sodium chloride inside the lumen. Now, if there is a decrease in the sodium chloride in the macula densa, these guys, which are these specific macula densa cells, are going to activate the juxtaglomerular cells to release the renin. Now, let's think about it. When can the, the sodium chloride be decreased? It can be decreased if you just don't take sodium chloride on one hand. But a very common thing is basically, for example, if you drink a protein shake, you know the protein shake is actually rich with single amino acids. Now, these amino acids are going to reach the proximal convoluted tubule, you know, and here we have the active absorption of the amino acids. Now, for the active absorption of the amino acids, it's a secondary type, secondary active transportation, 
which actually requires to pump a sodium ion with each amino acid, right? Now, if you have actually uh, drunk, uh, drank an, a protein shake, which means that there, there would be a lot of amino acids in the proximal convoluted tubule, and this means that there would be a lot of absorption of the amino acid, which actually means that there would, uh, there would be also a lot of absorption of the sodium. So basically, the concentration of the sodium is going to be decreasing uh, along the nephron because we are basically absorbing it along with the amino acids. So the concentration of the sodium at the macula densa would be low. And this, would, this is going to lead to the activation of the juxtaglomerular cells to release the renin. And when the renin is released, the perfusion of the kidney is going to be increased. We're going to explain how. Now, when the perfusion of the kidney is increased, this means that the urination is going to increase. And that's maybe why you actually experience a polyuria kind of, or increase in the urination whenever you drink um, a protein shake, or whenever you have this extra protein-rich meals, right? Now, let's actually get it started with the RAS system. Now, we have in our liver, which is the main uh, factory of most of the proteins in our body, right? It is producing a protein called angiotensinogen. Now, the angiotensinogen isn't the active, is not, isn't the active of the, uh, the active form of the protein. It is a pro-protein. So it basically needs to be converted into the active form. Now, whenever the kidney has experienced any of each, either a sympathetic activation or renal hypotension or decrease in the sodium chloride at the macula densa, we say that it is going to release the pro-renin. Now, the pro-renin is going to be actually activated, it is going to be converted into the renin, which is the active form. Now, the renin is an enzyme that is going to basically break the angiotensin gene and break it down into the angiotensin 1. Now, the angiotensin 1 isn't even the active form. We need it to be converted further into the angiotensin 2. Okay, so this should be an N. Anyway, so the angiotensin 1 is not the active form, but it should be converted to the angiotensin 2, which is the active form. And this is basically the function of the ACE enzyme, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme. Now, this enzyme is mainly present in the endothelial cells of the vasculature of the lungs. It is also present in other organs as well, but it is mainly concentrated in the lung. So, it is going to actually convert the angiotensin 1 to the angiotensin 2, and this is going to continue the function of the RAS system. Let's stop here and see what other function does the ACE enzyme have. Besides the activation of the angiotensin 1 to 2, it is also responsible for, de for the degradation of the bradykinin into the inactive kinase. Now, what is the bradykinin? We know that the bradykinin is on one hand a vasodilator, and on the other hand, it is actually responsible for the activation of the sensory fibers that are present in the lung. Now, let's imagine that a patient had basically an ACE enzyme that is not functioning well or it was inhibited for some reason. Now, if the ACE enzyme wasn't functioning that well, this means that the bradykinin is going to be ac accumulating in his body. And when the bradykinin accumulates, it is going to lead to the irritation of the lungs by the activation of the sensory fibers that are present in the lungs. And this is going to lead to coughing. Okay, so this is one important note that you should keep aside that we're going to talk about later. Now, let's get back to the angiotensin 2. So, we said that the angiotensin 2 is basically the active form, right? Now, so the, angio the angiotensin, okay, so this is angiotensin, right? Okay, whatever. Yeah, so the angiotensin 2 is going to actually act on the angiotensin receptor, which actually we have two forms of it, right? We have the angiotensin receptor number one, and we have the angiotensin receptor number two. Now, so, so you don't get confused, we have angiotensin receptor one here. The main function of the angiotensin two is basically on angiotensin receptor type one. Now, this receptor is a GQ receptor. It is a G protein coupled receptor of the Q type, which is gonna end up uh, increasing the IP3 yeah, it is not our topic anyways. So, when the angiotensin 2 has been produced, it is going to act on the angiotensin receptor number 1, 
which is a GQ. And this is going to end up with the three main things that are going to actually represent the function of the RAS system. Now, the first one is the, uh, is the so-called the rapid presser function. Now, what is the rapid presser? The rapid presser is basically when the angiotensin 2 binds to this receptor, it is going to lead to direct vasoconstriction. So this actually means that the angiotensin 2 itself is a vasoconstrictor on one hand. On the second hand, it is going to lead to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And we know that the activation of the sympathetic nervous system is going to end up with vasoconstriction as well. The third thing is that the activation of this angiotensin receptor number one, which is a GQ, is going to lead to the increase of the noradrenaline release and it is going to lead to decrease in the noradrenaline reuptake and it is going to increase the noradrenaline response. Now, you may remember this from Pharmacology 1 in your uh, noradrenergic um, in neurons topic. It actually says that there is a pre-junctional communication, you know, there is a pre-junctional communication and regulation of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And when we were speaking about the sympathetic nervous system in the pre-junctional regulation, we said that whenever there is an activation of the angiotensin uh, of the angiotensin receptor type one, which is a GQ form, this is going to lead to activation of the release of the noradrenaline release. Okay. Now, so we know that the increase of the noradrenaline release, this is basically like the sympathetic activation. It is going to also end up with vasoconstriction. Now, besides all of that, there is going to be also increase in the adrenaline release. And we know that the adrenaline comes from the adrenals, so basically the angiotensin 2 is going to lead to the activation of the adrenal uh, glands release of the adrenaline. Okay, so just to sum up, the rapid pressure is basically the angiotensin 2 has a direct vasoconstriction and it is going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And it is going to also have a direct effect on increasing the noradrenaline release, decreasing the reuptake, and increasing the noradrenaline response, in addition to acting on the adrenal cortex, increasing the adrenaline release. Now, the second function of the angiotensin receptor type 1 is the slow presser function. Now, slow presser is basically by increasing the aldosterone, which means that it is again the, the, this receptor is also present in the adrenal cortex and it is, uh, is going to lead to the increase in the aldosterone release as a response to the activation of the receptor by the angiotensin 2. Now, we know that the aldosterone is going to end up acting on the nephron, increasing the noradrenaline and uh, in, increasing the sodium and the water reabsorption in the nephron, right? So the aldosterone increases the water as well as the sodium reabsorption in the nephron. And it is going to lead to vasoconstriction of the efferent. Now, if we thought about it, that there was a vasoconstriction here at the efferent arterial. So if this got smaller, we know that actually the filtration to the, to the nephron is going to increase, which actually we want. So this is the second thing of the slow pressure function. Now, the third one is to increase the ADH, which is the antidiuretic hormone, which is going to act on the nephron to increase the water reabsorption. So basically here, we're going to end up increasing the volume of the blood by increasing the water and the sodium retention. And this is going to increase the volume of the blood, increase the pressure of the blood and increase the perfusion to the kidneys. Okay, now the third function of the angiotensin 2 on the angiotensin receptor type 1 is basically it is going to increase the expression of the proto-oncogene. You know that the proto-oncogene is basically going to increase the survival of the cells. This is one thing. The second thing that it is going to also increase the, the growth uh, factors production and the extracellular matrix production. Now, what, what like do all these sum up as? So all of these are going to basically lead to the hypertrophy of both the, the uh, cardiac muscle itself in addition to the vessels. So the vessels are going to become uh, stiffer and this means that actually the, um, the afterload of the heart is going to be increased. So what does this mean? That basically, okay, that the RAS system is helping the kidney to survive this, the stressful situation but on the other hand, on the long run, on the long-term activation 
of the right system, this is not going to be good because it is going to lead to hypertrophy of the heart as well as the vessels. And this is going to basically uh, slowly deteriorate. So the categories of the drugs that we're going to cover, uh, that we're going to cover, the first one is basically the drugs that are renin inhibitors. They are going to basically inhibit the binding of the angiotensinogen to the renin. So it is basically just blocking the active site of the enzyme. Now the second one is going to be the ACE inhibitor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And the third category is going to be the angiotensin receptor blockers. Okay, so guys, uh, let's get into the indication before going in, in details in each category. Now let's start with the, uh, the hypertension. So we know that basically the RAS system is going to end up increasing the volume of the blood and doing so much vasoconstriction by direct vasoconstriction and by increasing the sympathetic nervous system and the effects that we have talked about already including the rapid depressor and the slow presser so basically if someone has uh, if someone has a hypotension we can give actually um, we can give uh, drugs from the categories that we're going to mention in order to decrease the blood pressure now the second one is the heart failure patient and uh, this is basically because when we give the drugs acting on the RAS or mainly the ACE inhibitors, we can actually decrease the preload on the heart as well as the afterload on the heart and the remodeling. Now, decreasing the preload is basically by inhibiting the increasing volume of the blood, by inhibiting the aldosterone, release it from the adrenal cortex by inhibiting the production of the angiotensin 2. Now, the second one is decreasing the afterload, and this is basically by inhibiting the vasoconstriction that would happen if we had an activated RAS activation on one hand, in addition to decrease the remodeling that is going to happen to both the heart and the vessel. So the stiffness of the vessel, the hypertrophy in the smooth muscle of the vessels is going to also increase the afterload of the heart, and we can just um, we can decrease that if we have given an ACE inhibitor. Now the third one is going to be the myocardial infarction. Now as you know, after a myocardial infarction, there is going to be like scarring uh, of the heart, forming like connective tissues, replacing the muscle, so we can decrease this remodeling, uh, remodeling process that is going to happen in the heart after a myocardial infarction by using the ACE inhibitors. Now the other one is going to basically be uh, the uh, diabetic nephropathy. Whenever there is a diabetic nephropathy, uh, there is basically also remodeling of the kidneys that is going to deteriorate its function. So we can use the RAS, uh, um, the drugs acting on the RAS and mainly the ACE inhibitors in order to get rid of the deteriorating uh, nephropathy as well. Now the chronic renal failure also uh, applies to that, decreasing the remodeling that is going to happen in the kidney on the long run. Now, so let's get in details uh, what um, uh, does the ACE inhibitor include. So the ACE is the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Now, this category of the drugs is divided into three main uh, subgroups, and this is uh, the, uh, this is dependent on the chemical background of the drug. So if it actually contains sulfadrilic group, it would be the captopril. Okay, and if it contains the dicarboxylic group, then it would be the lisinopril, enalapril, ramipril, and benazepril. And if it contains the phosphorus group, it would be the phosinopril. Now, um, the, uh, the word active that you can see beside uh, captopril and lisinopril indicates that only these two guys are basically in the active form. So we give the drug, the drug is already active, it doesn't need to be converted into something else to give an active product. Uh, unlike the other guys here that are pro-drugs, so basically they need to be converted from a pro-drug into the drug, which is going to be the active uh, form of these guys, and uh, the active form is going to do the function. Now, and we know that most of it, most of the pro-drug to drug conversion is going to happen in the liver, sometimes in the blood itself. Now, uh, let's actually see what is the difference uh, that actually, uh, that is actually behind having a sulfadrily group comparing with the others, and mainly the dicarboxyl. So in this, we're going to actually compare mainly the sulfadrily with the dicarboxyl. Now you know that the dicarboxylic group is actually going to make these, uh, these guys more water soluble. 
So basically, the sulfidryl group comparing to the dicarboxylic group is less water soluble, and uh, this actually means that it is more lipid soluble, and the oral bioavailability is going to be higher. So basically, the captopril concentration in the systemic circulation after giving an oral pill is going to be higher than these guys if they were given orally, right? And this is because they have a high lipid solubility, so they can just cross it through uh, the uh, cells that are lying the GI system. Now, uh, the um, captopril is going to actually peak in the blood faster than the others, and it is going to be eliminated faster than the others as well, and it is, uh, its elimination is mainly in the kidney. Actually, most of them in the kidney, but a couple of them also in the uh, liver. But for the captopril, it is exclusively eliminated in the kidney to the urine. And the half-life of the captopril is going to be shorter than the other because it is eliminated faster. And the dose that is needed for the treatment is going to be much higher for the captopril than the others. Although it has a higher oral bioavailability, but the dose that is needed is actually uh, the highest in case of the captopril comparing to all the other drugs. Now, let's see actually what side effects do these guys have. Um, we know that basically what they, uh, what they have done is basically they inhibited the ACE enzyme that was responsible for the activation of the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 on one hand, and it has also blocked the degradation of the bradykinin, which means that the bradykinin is accumulating. And if you remember, I mentioned that if the bradykinin is accumulating, this is going to lead to the irritation of the sensory nerve fibers that are present in the uh, lung, and this is going to lead to coughing. So our first side effect is going to be coughing. Now, the second side effect is going to be the angioedema. Now, the angioedema uh, is also due to the accumulation of the bradykinin, because I mentioned that the bradykinin is also a vasodilator. Now, what is going to happen here? So we inhibited the ACE enzyme, right? The bradykinin has accumulated. It has irritated the sensory fibers cause, uh, causing coughing. And uh, then it has led to so much vasodilation that is going to lead to angioedema. Now, what is the angioedema? It's basically a rapid swelling that would happen in the nose area, in the lips, in the tongue, in the larynx, which actually means that the patient would suffocate if we didn't stop the drug. So always stop the, dr uh, the drug, uh, stop the treatment, if actually the uh, patient has developed either or both of them. Now, our third side effect is going to be the proteinuria. Now, the proteinuria is basically, uh, it basically indicates that the kidney function is actually being disturbed. The kidney structure is being destroyed. And this is basically uh, an acute renal failure. Now, why would this happen? We have mentioned that the RAS system is actually the security system, right? So when the kidney feels that there is a shortage of the supply, it would actually activate the RAS system. Now, so the kidney has activated the RAS system because it, ne it, uh, uh, it needed mo uh, to increase the perfusion. What if we have pre prevented the activation of the RAS system? This means that the shortage of the supply, the shortage of the perfusion of the kidney is going to continue. And we say that the kidney is in continuous need of a lot of oxygen for the active transport functions, which actually means that the cells are going to start dying immediately if the, uh, if, the uh, if, the perfusion, if the low perfusion continues. And this is going to lead to the acute renal failure. So, when does this the acute renal failure really happen? Uh, to what category of patients? It is basically the patient who has a bilateral renal artery stenosis. So if the patient has a bilateral uh, renal artery stenosis, he's definitely gonna develop an acute renal failure if you give an ACE inhibitor. Okay, so if this is our first contraindication of the uh, ACE inhibitors. You can't, you, uh, you must not actually uh, give the ACE inhibitor to a patient who has a bilateral renal artery stenosis on one hand, or a patient who has a congestive heart failure. You know, if, if a patient has a congestive heart failure, this means that the pumping function of the heart is really weak, which means that the perfusion of the kidney is really low. Why would you give an ACE inhibitor? This is going to even decrease the perfusion of the kidney and it is going to lead to the death of the cells there. So it is the, our second contraindication of the ACE inhibitors. Now, 
The fourth side effect here is basically the tea indicates the taste, which is the dysgeusia. Dysgeusia is basically disturbance of the taste function. I don't know why, but it is a side effect. Then we have the orthostatic hypotension. Now, the orthostatic hypotension, basically, we said that the RAS system was responsible for increasing the blood volume, increasing the vasoconstriction, which would elevate the blood pressure. When we stop the RAS system by using an ACE inhibitor, this actually means that we have prevented the increase of the volume, we have in, uh, prevented the vasoconstriction as well, and this actually in, uh, means that the blood pressure is going to drop, right? Now, so whenever the patient is gonna, uh, stands up, he's going to actually feel dizzy right away. In addition to visual disturbance, he may even faint because of the orthostatic hypotension, right? But actually, this, uh, this orthostatic hypertension that is de uh, developing in a patient who's using an ACE inhibitor wouldn't activate a reflex tachycardia. So there is an orthostatic hypertension, but no reflex tachycardia. But why? Actually, because the ACE inhibitors, they also inhibit the baroreceptors that are responsible for the reflex tachycardia on one hand, and they also enhance the tone of the vagus nerve. Uh, of the biggest nerve, which actually means that they are increasing the parasympathetic function. So that's why they are going to develop an orthostatic hypertension with no reflex tachycardia. Moving to the next side effect is in a pregnancy. Now, let's see, can we give an ACE inhibitor to a pregnant woman? Absolutely not. It is an absolute contraindication. Now, why? Okay, imagine that the ACE inhibitor has actually reached the circulation of the fetus. Now it is circulating in the blood of the fetus, going into the kidney, and uh, then to the lungs and inhibiting the ACE enzyme in the lung. Now, this actually means that there is no RAS system active in the fetus. Now, what would the RAS system do to the fetus? The RAS system was increasing the perfusion of the kidney and increasing the urination in the fetus. Now, when we stop the RAS system, this actually means that we decrease the perfusion and we decrease the urination. Now, the urination in the fetus was responsible for the formation of the amniotic fluid. Now, by decreasing the amni amniotic fluid, we have actually developed an oligohydromnion in the fetus. Uh, and this is going to lead to actually disturbance of the development of the lung leading to a pulmonary hypoplasia on one hand and it is going to also lead to a fetal uh, calvarial hypoplasia and it is going to lead to anuria and it may even end up with a fetus death uh, with a fetus dead, right? Uh, so it is an absolute contraindication. So, so far we spoke about the three contraindications, the bilateral renal artery stenosis, the congestive heart failure, and the third is the pregnancy. Now, moving to the next is basically a rash. So the patient who's receiving an ACE inhibitor might develop a maculopapular rash, and uh, there is going to be an ion disturbance. There is going to be a hyperkalemia. Now, why would it be a hyperkalemia? Because we have, it, we have stopped the aldosterone uh, production by inhibiting the angiotensin II formation. And we know that the aldosterone was responsible for increasing the potassium and the proton uh, elimination. And when we stop this, this is going to develop a hyperkalemia. Okay, does this develop in every single patient who's receiving an ACE inhibitor? Well, it wouldn't actually develop as severe as the ones who are receiving, for example, um, uh, potassium sparing diuretics or potassium uh, supplements or patients who have already a renal failure or a patient who, who's receiving NSAIDs or patients who receiving, who's receiving a, a beta blocker, okay? So in, in these guys, uh, we should actually really, really watch out for uh, the potassium levels in the blood because a hyperkalemia is going to be expected. Now, the last side effect is a leukopenia, which is mainly a neutropenia kind of, but it is really rare. Now, the second category that we have is the non-peptide angiotensin receptor 1 blockers. So basically now we're going to just block the receptor itself, which actually means that the angiotensin 2 has been produced, the renin has been produced, everything is going well. We just blocked the, the last step, which is basically the action of the angiotensin 2 on the receptor. Now, why did we say not non-peptide? It is because the, uh, if it was peptide, then we can't give it orally. Okay, now why would we use the ARB 
like why wouldn't we use the ACE? We use them only if the patient has developed coughing or angioedema after we have given the ACE inhibitors. Now, here we have the Losartan, the Erbisartan, the Eprosartan, the Valsartan, Tilmisartan, and Candisartan. I don't know, like, you can just find uh, somehow to memorize this. Okay, now next is going to be the uh, renin inhibitors. Now, the renin inhibitors, well, they are not that commonly used. I don't think they are used at all, but whatever. Now, so we know that uh, the first step of the production of the renin is the production of the pro-renin, okay? So I forgot to write that this is the pro, okay? So let's just write here, it is pro, pro-renin, right? And the pro-renin is going to go through uh, degradation to form the active form, which is basically the renin, right? So um, the renin, which is the active form, before actually applying the drug, is used to bind the angiotensinogen and then convert it to the angiotensin uh, 1, right? Now, when we get the renin inhibitor, it is going to block the binding site of the enzyme, which is the renin, and this means that there is no further angiotensin 1 production from the angiotensinogen. And uh, here we have the adescarine that might be used for hypertension, and we have the enalkarine which is not really used at all for humans, it is, I think it is only for experiments. Now, uh, we have also uh, the beta blockers. Whenever you give a beta blocker, we know that there is a beta-1 adrenergic receptor present on the juxtaglomerular cells. So if we give a beta blocker, we block this receptor, which means that we decrease the renin uh, production. This is an indirect way of decreasing the renin production. Uh, I think that's all for this topic. Thank you so much for watching this.